Welcome to our talk this afternoon. I'm Robert Bell, and the talk this afternoon is a brief history on Japanese printmaking, focusing on the ukiyo-e prints, the prints of the flo floating world. Under normal times, I give talks several times a year at Highlands and Kennedy Hall, where we pull prints from Highlands collection and my collection on various topics in the history of printmaking. Um, and we pass the actual prints around, and you, they can be examined up close, the way prints are made to be viewed. And we discuss various topics, such as specific artists, such as Whistler or Goya, or um, print, uh, artistic movements, like prints of the Expressionists or the Impressionists, and um, so on. Um, unfortunately, during these times, we're um, forced into doing a video show. But um, if things continue to improve in the fall, um, by this coming September of 2021, we may be back live again at Highlands University. The prints are open not only to the, the print uh, lectures are open not only to the Highlands community, but to um, anyone in the area who wants to show up and learn about the history of printmaking. One of the things I like to do is um, put um, prints and the movements and we're discussing in context and in comparison with um, what's going on in other parts of the world and other movements. So we'll start with a um, brief history that doesn't start in Japan, but in China. Um, we all know that virtually every technological advance in the world started in China. Uh, from gunpowder to uh, printing to opera to whatever, you name it, and it probably started in China. So printmaking and publishing uh, requires um, a um, good source of paper that can withstand um, pre the pressure of printing and drawing. And it's thought that paper making started in uh, China around the first century AD. And there are examples of uh, relief printing uh, that go back uh, many centuries before um, they, it started in the Western um, art field. We often mention in Western art the um, Gutenberg uh, developing the printing press and movable type around 1455. But in fact, um, in the 11th century, Pai Sheng actually invented a printing press and movable type which um, did not catch on because the type was made out of clay uh, letters, which broke down easily. And uh, this also, you have to take into account that Chinese, there are thousands of Chinese characters where in the West we only have to deal with uh, 10 numbers and 26 letters and a few other things. So printing and um, images done in China and Korea <coughs> and Japan um, were carved onto total blocks in relief. And what we'll be talking about mainly today is relief printing, where um, a block is carved away, and the image is left standing, which is inked and uh, paper placed over that. In Western printing, the printing press was used, but in China, Korea, Japan, um, the images and uh, books were all printed by hand by rubbing a tool called a baren. Uh, over the paper to pick up the ink. So this first print is an example of a Chinese print that was done around 1600, showing an example of early Chinese printing. The period we'll be looking at <coughs> um, today will mainly focus on the color um, Japanese prints that really blossomed between uh, around the 1780s up to the 1850s. What's remarkable um, about the period of color Japanese uh, printmaking is that there was nothing like it going on elsewhere in the world. Um, although the Europeans had a head start on relief printmaking, um, the color printmaking, and this you could always color a print by hand, but to actually print color, 
was much later in getting started in European printmaking. An early attempt at color printmaking in Europe was known as chiaroscuro, where there was the black outline print and a, usually one or occasionally two color background prints. And this is a print by Lucas Cranach uh, from around 1530. So why was there not a lot of Japanese printmaking going on in the 1500s? Well, <clears throat> Japan was involved in a brutal civil war that went on for more than a century and didn't end um, until um, the early 1600s. And um, there was very little publishing or anything going on except war making up until early 1600s when the um, Tokugawa um, shogunate um, finally won this civil war and set up a central government um, in early 1600. And they realized that to make sure no more civil war broke out, they um, organized things very carefully. They moved um, the seat of government to a small town of Edo in Japan, 350 miles from the old imperial capital of Kyoto, and um, basically built a new town there that by 1700 was um, probably the largest city in the world with, over a, popu with a population of over a million people. Um, once uh, peace had settled in, prosperity settled, People went back and forth be, uh, between Kyoto and Edo, but a very major organized city built up, including um, what was known as the Washawara District, um, which was the district of tea houses, the Kabuki Theater, and um, the area where the courtesans and ge geisha uh, worked. Um, a very strict caste system was in effect with um, the um, samurai and royal families at the top of this system. Below them were the uh, farmers or peasants who were very important because they grew all the rice which um, not only fed the country but was essentially a form of currency. At the bottom of the pile, as usual, <coughs> were the um, artisans, the artists, and the merchants. But um, because of the government being moved to this new developing city of e Edo, um, and all the um, services and things that had to be supplied to this large growing population there, the merchants rapidly became uh, the class that had all the money. And um, with all the money, they were looking for things um, to spend their leisure time. And the, the Yashawara district grew up with, that had all the entertainment. And on top of that, people began being interested in books and publishing companies uh, started developing in Edo. So by the uh, mid-1700s, uh, there were a number of publishing companies. Books were being published. and um, it was just as easy to include illustrations in the, these books. The term ukiyo comes from a Buddhist term meaning misery and suffering, but the Japanese used a pun um, on the words so that ukiyo um, meant that became known as the floating world or the world of pleasures and the ephemeral aspects of life. When you add the letter E on the end and the word becomes ukiyo-e, it refers to pictures of the floating world. Um, the subject matter of these prints, of course, um, were uh, the geisha, the courtesans, the kabuki actors, um, and images of nature, uh, fleeting images of birds and flowers and so on. It was only later uh, in the 1800s with Hokusai and Hiroshige that landscape became a major topic of the um, Japanese prints. Um, originally, the uh, ukiyo-e was a term that came to be used in literature and there were ukiyo-e uh, artists who were painters and so on. And we also have to remember that the fine arts of Japan were considered to be the paintings on silk, 
the enameled work and the fine porcelain and so on. Um, the prints were sort of like the Sunday comic section and weren't held in high regard and so on. But um, it was realized that um, by the uh, end of the 1700s when books were being printed and they were illustrated books, some publisher had the idea of um, separately starting to print um, picture images. And sure enough, they sold very well also. Initially, these were simple black and white pictures, as shown there. Um, and again, the um, topic were usually beautiful women or um, courtesans in their beautiful kimonos. So the first artist <coughs> who um, is associated with um, doing ukiyo-e uh, woodblock prints uh, was an artist named Moro Nubo. And uh, this is an image showing um, beauties of the four seasons. Now, the woodblock was printed in black and white and hand-colored. And so this is an image from the late 1700s. So <clears throat> the early prints were hand colored um, and they were in different formats. Later on, the, the size format became standardized. But um, in the early 1700s, um, again, the subject matter was still largely courtesans and kabuki actors. But some of the prints were colored with a very bright orange uh, dye. Um, and these were uh, known as tan prints. And this is an example of a courtesan, with this early style in the larger format and the bright yellow pigment. And another print from the same period of a kabuki actor. This is an ex another example of the tan prints with the bright orange coloring, which was applied on the uh, black and white matrix. So <clears throat> gradually, um, color blocks were added, but initially only two or three blocks. Um, this is a, a print of the Kabuki Theater um, in the Entertainment District, um, printed with um, one or two additional colors added. You can see the actors in the background and the people enjoying the performance. And then there was a period um, the 1740s and 50s also where um, the main color blocks were a pink or red and a green block. Again, the subjects are um, beautiful women, usually courtesans or geishas. And another print from the same period, kabuki actors being samurai warriors with just the uh, two color blocks added. <clears throat> so it was in 1765 that Japanese color printmaking really took off and got interesting. And uh, the date is known because um, there was a calendar done by Haranobu, um, a Japanese artist who's credited with um, developing the um, multicolored or brocade prints that uh, had anywhere from 10 to 20 uh, color blocks printed on top of the original black and white image. The reason the data is known is he did a calendar uh, in this style, um, which the date into Western uh, time translates to 1765. Aranobu became known for doing beautiful women um, in these multicolors. And um, at this point, the um, kimonos really began to stand out as part of the printmaking process. And this is a good time to discuss exactly how these prints were made. So <clears throat> um, we can jump forward briefly. Um, after Japanese printmaking was discovered in the West, as we'll discuss shortly, um, an European artist, Emil Orlik, who was Czech, took a trip to Japan. And um, he was mainly an etcher, but he took up uh, color wood make, woodcut making himself. And he did this triptych showing the basic um, methods of making a Japanese color print. In uh, the finished Japanese print, 
um, the signatures along the side of the print uh, give the name of the artist who is the person who gets the major credit uh, for the image. And he's shown on the left doing a drawing on a thin sheet of paper. Drawing was usually done in ink. The drawing would then be pasted face down on a usually a cherry block of wood and a skilled carver would carve the fine lines that would give you the key block of the image. And then a um, separate block for each color uh, would be carved by the expert carver and then printed in sequence by a printer. So um, you have the artist drawing the picture on the left, the carver carving the image onto the blocks, and then you have the printer on the right who's using a tool, um, the Baron, to uh, put pressure on the ink block to transfer the uh, pigment to the paper. And um, this process is repeated for each color block. Now there are several interesting differences between Western and uh, Eastern printmaking. The um, colors used in the inks in uh, Japanese printmaking were water-based and the early prints were vegetable dyes that faded when exposed to the light. So a lot of um, early prints um, show very little color at all. It wasn't until the 1800s that a new dyes came in and specifically Prussian blue that was light fast and you get the beautiful rich colors of the print, the landscape prints of Hiroshige and Hokusai, which we'll look at shortly. But um, European prints were printed on presses using oil-based inks. And the oil um, on the European wood blocks would actually help preserve the blocks. Um, when they look at um, edition sizes in European prints, you could print hundreds if not thousands of wood blocks without the block wearing out. In Japanese printmaking, using water-based inks, the block itself would become uh, water-soaked and you could usually only print about 200 images from the block uh, before you had to set it aside and let it dry out and start over. So this is um, Emil Orlik's depiction of the making of, a, of the color Japanese um, prints. In the 1950s, a Japanese company uh, published a book called The Making of a Japanese Print, and it was Haranobu's uh, Heron Maid. And this gives you an idea of what was involved in the complex process. <laughs> so what the book shows is um, starting with the black and white image and then it shows an image of the one color that would be added and it goes sequentially all the way down through about 15 colors to give you the final print. So you can see that the making of these spectacular prints was in, uh, very labor intensive. It was 1765 that that process was developed and by the 1780s and 90s spectacular prints were uh, color prints were being developed and um, again the subject matter was kabuki actors, courtesans, geisha, various flower and bird prints. At this point, um, um, as I say, landscape was still not a major subject for color prints. And what we'll do at this point is go into some of the best known ukiyo-e uh, printmakers from the 1780s and 90s up to the 1850s. Um, as a little background, there were um, probably thousands of printmakers. Um, most Japanese printmaking that we know about is known through the uh, a few dozen well-known printmakers, but there were actually hundreds and probably thousands of printmakers and it was estimated there were millions of these prints produced um, for the um, lower class. Um, one of the shoguns pronounced that uh, the ukiyo-e prints were not suitable for gentlemen or soldiers. 
but they were certainly um, well liked by the um, merchant class, who, as I say, was one of the lower classes. But um, one of the best known um, artists for kabuki actors was um, an artist named Sharaku. And uh, he produced um, these images. Very little is known about him. He appeared suddenly around 1795 and produced around 140 to 150 prints of kabuki actors. And is also known uh, for being the first one to do these close up, extremely expressive portraits and known for um, adding mica to the background, which gives a shine to the um, images. You can see in these two images of the same actor that um, in different editions, the colors vary slightly. Sharaku was also one of the first artists um, to make very identifiable uh, actors from specific productions known and um, people would buy these as souvenirs of the performance. And the, art, the um, actor's name was in the seal on his um, gown. And in um, prints where there are two uh, people, it was usually from a specific scene in a play where <clears throat> you could tell the good guy because his eyes are crossed and he's listening to an evil plot from the bad guy in the foreground. Um, and uh, he's showing utter surprise and he has to run off and tell his master about this evil plot so that it can be prevented. So apparently actors love Sh Sharaku's prints, but they seem to be less popular with the general uh, populace. And um, he only worked over a period of about a year making these prints and then disappeared as mysteriously as he had appeared and virtually no biographical um, information is known about him. It's thought that he was probably an actor himself who had turned artist. So we're mentioning only a few of the um, major artists, but Udamaro was considered um, one of the best of the ukiyo-e artists in, portray in portraying uh, beautiful women and courtesans. And these are examples of um, his works. He was one of the first to use these um, three-quarter bust uh, portraits with the beautiful kimono work. And these are examples of his. So by this time, there'd been a pretty much <clears throat> standard size for prints, um, for the paper and prints to be made. And so if someone wanted to do a larger print, um, they would often do a series of prints. And this is an example of one of Udamaro's triptychs. And um, it's an amazing print. One of the other um, points in um, his style was uh, the Japanese women suddenly gained about a foot in height. Uh, he was known for doing these tall, slender women, um, which could show off their kimonos in full length. And in this particular print, one of the things I find fascinating is the mosquito netting, which has been <laughs> carved in incredible detail. Udamaro is considered to be one of the best of the ukiyo-e printmakers. Um, <clears throat> so Udamaro is considered to be one of the finest of the ukiyo-e artists depicting beautiful women. Um, and as we've mentioned before, uh, the subject matter um, was severely limited by the censors. Um, at <clears throat> various times, um, even full um, large busts of actors were prohibited. Um, virtually all the artists we have discussed and are going to discuss, and this is another aspect of the ukiyo-e printmaking, but virtually all the artists um, produced um, not a few, but lots and lots and lots of prints referred to as shunga prints. These are or pillow prints or spring prints. And these are the um, highly sexual, extremely erotic um, images of um, people engaged in sexual activities. And um, although that type of print 
um, was officially banned in 1721, um, there was such a huge demand for it that they continued to be made um, throughout the history of ukiyo-e printmaking. Um, spoiler alert, um, if you've been hanging around waiting to see the Shunga prints, there aren't going to be any because I did not want Highland's website to be shut down for pornography. If you come to the actual lecture, we will look at some of these prints because they do form a basis for interesting discussion of the fine line between fine art and pornography. Um, Udamara was um, actually um, broke the law. He did a Shunga print involving a um, emperor who had died over 200 years before. And uh, that was the uh, current uh, people in power thought that he might be making a comment on the um, current governing body. And he was thrown in jail which was for three days, which was a huge disgrace. He died a year later. <clears throat> After Udamara left the scene, um, another artist, Udagawa Kunisada, became the best known artist for depicting uh, beautiful women and uh, um, actors. And these following prints are by him. And of note in these prints is you can see the deep blue that is in these prints, which was the Prussian blue that had started being imported and used in the um, uh, printmaking process. With um, people being punished for doing pictures of actors or being um, courtesans, um, becoming iffy material, subject material for prints. One of the most famous artists, Hokusai, um, published his landscape series, 36 Views of Mount Fuji in the early um, 1830s. And that's an image of the Great Wave, probably one of the single most famous images in art, not just Japanese ukiyo-e art. Um, later in life, he did another series, um, a hundred views of Mount Fuji that were published in a book, and that's a page from the book. And um, that's a self-portrait of uh, Hokusai teaching a drawing class um, in one of the views of uh, the hundred views of Mount Fuji. Prior to doing his 36 views of Mount Fuji, he had done numerous views of uh, wildlife, birds with flowers, uh, kabuki actor prints, and so on. However, <clears throat> the release of the 36 views of Fuji was so successful, it went through multiple editions. And um, one of the favorite questions of someone teaching Japanese art history is, how many <laughs> color woodcuts are in the 36 views of Mount Fuji? And the answer is, 46, because the series was so popular, he actually added another 10 images. He went on to do um, many single landscape prints, again, um, highlighting the uh, beautiful uh, effects of the um, Prussian blue dyes in the prints. And we'll finish uh, with Hokusai by showing another one of his black and white images from one of his last works, The Hundred Views of Mount Fuji. One of the remarkable things about Hokusai was not only the beautiful uh, line work and the compositions, but um, taking um, new views in the composition. And um, in this one, um, you see that there are geese flying over a lake, and Fuji is depicted as a reflection in the lake. So <clears throat> the um, ukiyo-e print publishing business was highly competitive. And one of Hokusai's main competitors was a younger artist, Hiroshige, shown here as portrait. This is actually a portrait done when he died uh, in the 1850s, uh, showing him with um, 
One of his fav uh, famous Im images, the sudden shower over the Shinohaki Bridge. Um, <clears throat> Hiroshige was a popular and well-known uh, ukiyo-e artist. Uh, he became even more well-known after his own series of landscapes, uh, which followed a couple of years after Hokusai's. Um, it, Hiroshige's um, first series of landscapes were the 53 stations of the um, Takeda. And um, another trick question, how many prints were in that series? There were actually 55 because he, uh, the Takeda was the road that ran between Tokyo and Kyoto. And um, he did an image of Tokyo and uh, Kyoto also, which made it actually 55 images in the series. That series was popular, and we know from documentation that um, there were probably at least 2,000 sets of the uh, Takeda um, published. Um, the um, old imperial palace was in Kyoto. The actual seat of government was in Edo. And so um, there was a lot of traveling back and forth um, and um, if you were a messenger, you could get there in 10 days, around 10 days running. They were, runners would run with messages back and forth. But if you were a traveler, you would either walk on foot or um, be carried. And um, there were, by official decree, stations along the way where people could rest their horses or get food or spend the night. And um, all those stations are depicted in Hiroshige's series. So <clears throat> although it might take as long as um, 53 days to get from Edo to Kyoto, these days you can make it in two hours by bullet train. Hiroshige also did beautiful other single landscapes and images of birds and flowers, which are some of those other pictures, as well as um, lots of Shunga prints. One of the things I find fascinating in the history of printmaking is how similar movements develop in other parts of the world independently. So when um, the um, shogunate took over and formed this uh, new government that ruled for almost 250 years in Japan, one of the things they did to make sure that it remained a stable country was they completely isolated Japan. In the 1500s, there were traders from Portugal, Spain, and the Netherlands uh, trading goods with Japan. But after the um, shogunate took over around 1610, they closed the country and they only allowed Dutch traders to continue to trade and only through the port of um, Nagasaki where the ships would unload their goods on an island in the harbor and the sailors were never allowed to shore and the people who received the goods from the Dutch trailers were, traders were never allowed on the mainland. Uh, travel was completely forbidden for people of all castes. If you left Japan, um, you could never come back. And um, so Japan um, developed this culture and this whole printmaking technique in complete isolation. So we've just, we've mentioned how Hokusai and Hiroshigo started doing landscape prints in Japan in the 1830s. But by coincidence, in Europe, in the history of European printmaking, um, a man named Charles Jock is considered to be the father of the etching revival in Europe. And this is a self-portrait of him and three examples of his landscapes. He was a friend of Millet and Corot and Daubigny, who were the founders of the Barba Barbizon School, which um, of course dealt mainly in landscapes and um, views of peasants. And so landscape um, painting and printmaking um, was taking off in Europe at about the same time it was taking off in Japan. Another um, European printmaker who 
got into landscapes was the British painter John Constable, who was known for his landscape paintings, but in the tradition, one of the purposes of printmaking to give your images wider circulation, he um, collaborated with a young mezzotint technician, David Lucas, who was just fresh out of training, and uh, together they published a series of 40 landscapes after Constable paintings. So <clears throat> here we had this um, complete, this phenomenon of um, beautiful colored Japanese woodblock printing going on in Japan, completely, almost completely unknown to the West. Um, but um, around 1853, um, the Americans decided with their usual diplomatic finesse policy known as gunboat diplomacy, sent Commodore Perry over and uh, sailed into the harbor, I think in Nagasaki, and said, either open up trade to us on your own or we will force you to. And so uh, the Japanese uh, uh, shoguns um, met and decided they would open up trade in limited ports. So one of the first things they started shipping to Europe was the fine uh, Japanese porcelain. And um, what did they wrap it in? They wrapped it in Japanese color woodcuts because they were so um, uh, inexpensive and readily available. should mention one other interesting thing. At the peak of the um, ukiyo-e printmaking and um, bookmaking, it's estimated that there were about six million sheets of the uh, Japanese paper being produced yearly uh, to, to support this um, enterprise. And it could do a whole lecture on the making of Japanese um, um, paper. Um, one other aside is um, Japanese paper is often referred to as rice paper, but rice I, I can assure you that no rice were killed in the making of any Japanese paper. It's actually mostly made out of a tree called paper mulberry in a very uh, labor-intensive project also. But getting back to the Japanese print showing up as packing material in Europe, uh, people noticed this very early and it came to the attention of uh, a number of artists, including Whistler and Mary Cassatt and Toulouse-Lautrec. And um, it started a whole movement known as Japanisma, where these Japanese color woodcuts had an influence on um, especially the Impressionists. And I'll show you some examples of um, an image of Hokusai's bridge. And uh, Whistler, who was one of the early enthusiasts of Japanese printmaking, did this image, Little Putney Bridge, um, very similar um, composition and structure of the bridge to Hokusai's image. <clears throat> and next we have an image of Hiroshige's um, heron in a rainstorm, an example, a little image of Pissarro uh, doing a rainstorm using the same technique of the long uh, diagonal lines depicting the rainstorm. So we had mentioned earlier that in printmaking, uh, in European printmaking, nothing um, came close to the colors of uh, Japanese woodblock printing where the colors were actually uh, applied using a printing process and not hand painted on. Um, however, that changed in the 1890s uh, with um, the Belle Epoque and also an, part of the Japanese movement. And um, we had a lot of color lithographs being done by people like um, Charest and Toulouse-Lautrec, which were definitely influenced by Japanese printmaking, not only in the way the color was used, but in the composition. And here we have one of Toulouse-Lautrec's with an example of an Udamaro woodcut. And another example of a Toulouse-Lautrec poster, um, Jean Avril uh, with the 
neck of the bass viol in the foreground in the pit orchestra, being as close as you'll get to a Schunger print in this lecture. Museums, including the Louvre, started collecting Chinese and Japanese uh, fine artworks like the porcelain and the ceramic dishes and the carved ivory figures. And they hired a um, French etcher, uh, Jules Jacques Marc, um, to catalog their collection. And so these are etchings from works that uh, Jacques Marc um, copied of pieces in the Louvre. Ukiyo-e <coughs> prints continue to be made up into um, about 1900. Um, they were still using the same techniques, multiple um, blocks. People were doing landscape series and so on. We've mentioned uh, the main artists that are known today. Um, there were other artists who did high quality work, but are not as famous as the ones we've discussed so far. Around 1900, uh, lithography and photography were introduced into Japan for reproducing art. And um, the process nearly uh, died out. The government realized that they were losing an extremely valuable art form. And uh, so they actually started training people to continue making uh, wood blocks in the traditional manner. And it's still being done to this day in Japan. Um, Japanese artists have taken up other forms of original printmaking, um, including intaglio printmaking, where you're printing on metal plates, as opposed to the relief printing that, of course, is the Japanese, was the Japanese traditional method. And I have examples of some modern prints by a Japanese printmaker named uh, Honda, uh, who works mainly in mezzotint. So, Printmaking is alive and well in Japan. So when we can, I like to close lectures by bringing things home to New Mexico. And of course, um, in New Mexico, <coughs> one of the internationally known color wood block artists was Gustav Bauman, who settled in here in New Mexico. And we have an example of one of uh, his prints, his color wood block prints which were made in the same manner as the Japanese printmakers with a different block carved for each color. Uh, this is his eagle dance at Tosuke. So um, Bauman uh, proceeded to do many prints of the Southwest and particularly New Mexico. About two years ago, at the History Museum in New Mexico, they held a seminar on Gustav Bauman. And um, someone told the story of, uh, in the 1950s, after World War II, a Japanese woodblock artist came to Santa Fe, and he went to the Fine Arts Museum. And he said, please, can someone tell me where I can meet the artist who does all his own work. Because Gustav Bauman would not only draw the pictures, he would carve the blocks and print them himself. So um, that's it for a brief history of Japanese printmaking. Again, thank you for um, signing in. The, <coughs> um, I want to mention at this time that um, Rene Buchanan is already underway for our fall New Mexico Painters Invitational Show, which we're hoping that will be uh, live this year, sometime in September or October, if everyone gets all their vaccines. So um, thank you again.